The sun has gone down at Hangman's Hill and the ghost at Misery Corner isn't walking tonight. So, welcome to the Weird Tales Radio Show, your weekly fix of ghost stories, urban myths, witchcraft, magic and folklore. And now, here's your host, writer, award-winning journalist, best-selling author and sometime werewolf hunter, Charles Christian. Hello and welcome to another episode of the Weird Tales Radio Show, the home of geek, folklore and paranormal entertainment with me, Charles Christian. As once again we delve into the worlds of weirdness, urban myths, history, geek culture, ghosts, magic, witchcraft, the occult and anything else I think will intrigue you. We have another interview this week, but as it's slightly shorter than those we've been having in recent times, we do have enough space in this show to carry some shorter items, as well as a few catch-up stories. And talking of catch-up news, the last time we did this, I was still reeling from having been hit by an email phishing attack that scammed my bank account. The latest on this is that half the money has been recovered. It may still be a few weeks before I learn the fate of the other funds and the bank has paid me a small sum of by way of compensation for their poor customer service. Which I suppose is better than a poke in the eye with a sharp stick. Moral of the story, never click on an email link when you're feeling tired, frazzled or under pressure. It takes just one moment of distraction and loss of focus to open up a whole world of pain. On a cheerier note, a couple of weeks ago, Janie and I got married. Again. Yes, I know, it's complicated. Please do try to keep up. We've now been married as many times as Liz Taylor married Richard Burton. And, in further domestic news, we have horses back on the farm for the first time in nearly five years. Two mares from a local rescue charity, so expect plenty of equestrian folklore from Janie in the weeks to come. As for my role in this escapade, I spent the better part of a week in a dust cloud of my own making, clearing out two old stables here at El Rancho Weirdo Tales. Along with piles of mouldy hay and rotten pallets, I also encountered a large number of long dead and now well mummified dead rats. Clearly the rat poison I put down did work. I have become Grim Squeaker, the death of rats which is a reference only fans of Terry Pratchett's Discworld novels will get. But there's more. Within the next week, I hope to have completed the first in a new series of Companion Weird Tales videos, called, not surprisingly, The Weird Tales Video Show, which will be available on the Weird Tales YouTube channel. More news on that as it happens. Time for the first of our news stories, and this involves an update on the infamous Jatlav or Dyatlov Pass incident, which took place in the Russian Urals mountain range in 1959, when a party of hikers died in mysterious circumstances. At the time they were found, they were observed to have suffered catastrophic head and chest injuries, they appear to have abandoned their campsite, and some of them were also naked. So had something terrible attacked them there at their campsite, something so awful that they'd rather rush out naked into the snow in the middle of the night rather than stay in the warmth and safety of their tents. Was it a wild animal? Bears, perhaps? Wolves? Or was it some kind of cryptid monster, such as a yeti or a werewolf? Alternatively, had one of the party gone mad and attacked the other members of the group in a murderous rage? Was it an attack by the Bashkirs, the local indigenous people? Spoiler alert, no it wasn't. Was it aliens? And yes, this has seriously been suggested on numerous occasions uh, for explaining it all. And finally... Was it a secret Russian military experiment that went badly wrong and the hikers were unfortunately collateral damage caught in the wrong place in the wrong time? 1959 was of course still in the bad old days of the Soviet Union. Stalin had only been dead about five years. And part of the mystery surrounding the Dyatlov Pass incident stems from the fact the Soviet authorities 
inevitably tried to suppress all news of the incident. Basically, they didn't know and they didn't want anybody else to know that they didn't know what the answer was. The official report said the cause of the deaths was an unknown natural force, was an unknown natural force, which was so bland as to not be accepted by anybody. And in turn, this gave birth to conspiracy theories, that it was a cover-up because the real truth was too awful or embarrassing for the Russians to reveal to the world. Like the fact it was maybe the aliens. 62 years later, uh, two scientists, Russian Alexander Putrin and Johann Gaum in Switzerland, have published a report in the scientific journal Communications, Earth and Environment, which suggests that a natural phenomenon, a snow avalanche, could have not only caused the deaths, but also the peculiar injuries and conditions of the body. As for the really weird stuff about the bodies being found with missing tongues and eyeballs, that was probably caused by scavenging animals. As Alexander Putrin subsequently commented, the problem with the Dyatlov Pass incident is people don't want it to have a normal explanation. They don't want it to be an avalanche. Yeah, I know, they'd rather it was aliens. So far, so weird. But now things, things take a surreal turn because during the course of their investigation, Johann Gaum contacted the Disney Corporation. Yes, the House of Mouse. Because as a researcher into the mechanics of snow and avalanches, he had been particularly impressed by the realistic computer animation effects in the 2013 Disney movie Frozen and asked if he could borrow their software code to create his own computer models of what may have happened at Dyatlov. Disney said yes, and lo and behold, the modelling supported the theory the hikers had been killed by an avalanche after they had accidentally destabilised a nearby snow wall, um, digging into a hillside to create a flat area to place their tents. Uh, as for the damage to the bodies, the two researchers also had access to motor industry data. Uh, one of the little secrets of the motor industry is that in the 1950s, they ran a series of staged accidents using human cadavers. So real live dead crash test dummies, uh, putting them through car accidents to see what effect it had on the bodies. And uh, combining that data with the Disney animation of the effects of a avalanche, um, they were able to conclude that the head and chest injuries would have been caused by the crushing effects of tons of snow falling on the bodies. Final thought. Caitlin Doughty, who runs the popular Ask a Mortician YouTube channel, recently made a video called Wait, the movie Frozen Solved the Dyatlov Pass Mystery. You'll find the links to the video in this show's podcast metadata on the Weird Tales Show YouTube channel. Look under the miscellany playlist and on the Urban Fantasies website. But basically, uh, she has lots of little like, clips from the movie and from the researchers to show just how the accident could have happened. So, Jatlov Pass solved, if you are prepared to accept. It has a mundane explanation and uh, you don't want it to be a conspiracy. American physicist and science writer Mark Buchanan recently wrote an op-ed for the Washington Post in the US warning that some people's obsession with making contact with aliens from beyond our galaxy could be extremely dangerous It was as it was almost inevitable they would belong to technically more advanced civilizations and there was no guarantee they would not also be hostile. Buchanan gives the example of Christopher Columbus and later the conquistadores arriving in the Americas and very quickly destroying the ancient civilizations they found there, including the Aztecs and the Incas. Even if the aliens didn't try to conquer us, there is always the risk they might expose us to diseases we have no natural protection against. 
For example, the conquistadores' conquest of Central and Southern America was undoubtedly helped by the fact the Europeans spread smallpox, measles and mumps, for which the indigenous natives had no natural immunity, reducing some New World populations by as much as 90%. This is how Hernán Cortés, the leader of the Spanish conquistadores, was able to capture the Aztec capital of Tenochtitlan, now Mexico City a city of 200,000 people, with just an army of 1,000 men. Yes, the conquistadores had firearms, but they also brought smallpox, which killed 80,000 Aztecs living in the city within a space of 12 months. So, space scientists, stop trying to contact alien races. They may arrive bringing not just powerful ray guns, but also space measles. Now time for this week's interview. Our guest is Dr. Gustav Kern, who is a reader in psychology at Goldsmiths College, which is part of the University of London. Dr. Gustav runs Goldsmiths Magic Research Laboratory. He is also president of the Science of Magic Association, or SOMA, and a member of the Experimental Psychology Society, and also a member of the Magic Circle, which is the... uh, professional group for stage magicians in the UK. No prizes for guessing that we're going to be talking about magic, but not so much ritual magic in the Alistair Crowley style, but the method stage magicians use to create their illusions and misdirect their audiences, and how exactly the same techniques are now being used by politicians and in marketing campaigns. Right, well, it's my great pleasure to uh, be talking to, I'm going to now fluff your name, uh, Gustav Kuhn. And what attracted me was seeing a report on the BBC News about how magicians' tactics are found in politics and marketing. And then I had a look up at your profile and see that this is an area you've been studying in terms of free will, misdirection, the scientific study of magic, and you're even a member of the Magic Circle. Yes. (laughs) Yes, I've spent the last... uh, Thank you, Charles. Yeah, I spent the last 20... I mean, I started my career as a magician uh, where I used all of these principles simply as a form of entertainment. But for the last 20 years or more, I've been trying to use magic as a way of uncover some of the mysteries of the human mind. And so we study a lot of these principles in the lab to try and discover more about how the human brain works. Yeah. Yeah, because that's the magic research lab. Is that the... (laughs) Yeah, so I had the uh, the Magic Lab, which stands for Mind Attention and General Illusory Cognition. It's a slightly forced acronym, but it <laughs> <laughs> but it serves as well in terms of describing some of the things that we do. Yeah. So we study misdirection to learn more about how the ease by which you can influence what people see, or more importantly, what they don't see. Yeah. Uh, we study forcing principles. So forcing refers to the magician's ability to influence your decision making. And again, a lot of this work can tell us a lot about the nature of free will um, and the ease by which you can use suggestions and other psychological manipulations to influence your decision making. But we also apply a lot of this work to the real world. Um, So for example, we've got a project in which we try to implement some of these misdirection principles into computer games to see what happens when computers start deceiving humans. Um, some of these forcing principles have been implemented in computer, sort of like in computer games to see whether we can induce this illusory sense of free will in a gaming environment. And um, it seems to be quite effective, we're quite effective at doing so. Um, and even studying how magic can be used to enhance people's well being. So in the magic lab, we fully embrace magic and the scientific study of magic and we try and apply it to as wide a field as possible. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Now, I mean, it's an intriguing topic in that magic in its broadest sense has been a part of the part of human culture from earliest times, but it's always one of those that's not thought to be, if you like, 
proper and worthy of academic study. You know, medicine, yes, which is another ancient discipline, but magic, even though it's something every resonates with everybody, has always seemed to be slightly pushed under the carpet. Why do you think that is? Why has it had such a poor reputation? Yeah, that's a really interesting question. I mean, I got into psychology through magic. Um, I started, I, I was obsessed by magic as a teenager. And I tried pretty much anything to improve my magic. Um, I took drama classes. I tried to learn how to do palm reading. Um, I even took jazz dance classes, which were complete <laughs> failure, as my kids and everybody who's ever seen me dance <laughs> will testify. Um, but of course, the clearest link between magic to improve my magic was to learn more about how the human mind works. And I then started. I, I then went to study psychology as a way of improving my magic. But to my big surprise, I realized that very few academics had taken magic seriously and they hadn't, there was virtually nothing on the psychology of magic within the academic literature. Um, now about a hundred years or over a hundred years ago, Alfred Binet, who's uh, better known for the invention of intelligence testing um, and others such as Max Desoir, they had a very keen interest in magic and they realized that well, this is really cool illusions that we could study. And so around 1900, there was a flurry of investigations into magic. But then since then, that completely disappeared. And uh, I think probably one of the reasons for this is behaviorism. So behaviorists who took over the predominant sort of like theories in psychology from the 1900s, they didn't really believe in human experience. They just wanted to explain all behavior in terms of stimulus and response and sort of simple forms of conditioning. And so this was a time where a lot of topics that are now considered to be some of the most sexy topics in psychology completely disappeared. So mm -hmm. for example, consciousness. Um, I mean, even in the 1980s, the study of conscious or scientific study of consciousness was a fairly controversial area because people felt well how can you study something that seems so flaky and i think it's probably the same with magic i think there was an initial interest and then people just forgot about it um and it's only been fairly recently that scientists from all over the world have taken up the study of magic and it's becoming a much bigger area to explore i mean i presume over in the anthropology side of the academic world, magic's been there because there's always that element of magic and religion in other societies. But um, you're talking yeah. about the Western world. Yeah, I mean, I find it difficult to distinguish. I wouldn't necessarily distinguish between the two. I think traditionally they have, people have been distinguishing them. Um, a lot of anthropologists have uh, been very interested in studying magic, but they've mostly focused on the magic ritual and the function that these rituals play rather than the techniques that are used to create these experiences. So as psychologists, we are more interested in understanding how you can create these experiences, as well as the impact that these experiences have on people's beliefs and potentially the nature of these experiences as well. Um, but I think, I think most anthropologists, they have very much differentiated between magic as a ritual and magic as a form of entertainment. Um, whilst as a psychologist, we tend to treat the two as fairly similar. Just slightly jumping around a bit, I see one of the things you look at um, is magical thinking. Now, I'll ask you to define what you mean by it, but I've always thought magical thinking is that kind of... Well, most politicians seem to believe in it, but um, a lot of other people do that, you know, if I keep buying the uh, lottery scratch cards, I'll win money and that'll solve all my problems. It's a kind of not wanting to face reality, but thinking if something would be different, all their problems would be solved. <laughs> Yeah, magical thinking is a difficult term to define and different disciplines use slightly different definitions. So in clinical psychology, magical thinking generally refers to beliefs in things that you know to be impossible. Um, so for example, in obsessive compulsive disorder, you consciously know that some of your behaviors won't have an impact 
on what on, on what you're on what you're doing, and yet you feel compelled to carry out these actions. So here, you consciously know that your you know that your behavior won't have an impact and we generally think of magical thinking as beliefs in things that are generally accepted to be impossible um but so but yeah defining the term is really rather is, is rather, rather difficult which is why whenever we study these principles we have to come up with a fairly solid working definition but it's important to note that there is no universally accepted definition of magical thinking it very much depends on what field you're studying right let's get let's get back then to the uh bbc report and uh, one of the things you're talking about there is the illusion of choice. Tell us something about that. Yeah, so the illusion of choice refers to, in, within the magic context, we studied this in the context of forcing. So forcing is a broad magic principle uh, whereby magicians can influence the decisions or the outcome that your decision has. So, for example, in a typical card trick, you, I might ask you to pick a card and you feel that you've chose, had a completely free choice, and yet the magician was able to influence that choice or predict that choice. And um, many of these principles, they rely on exploiting certain cognitive biases and stereotypes. So, for example, in one of these studies, if you have, if we place four playing cards in front of you and I ask you to simply touch one of these cards and then take that card, um, most people, about 60% of people, will choose the card that is right in front of them. Um, now, the reason for this is that we're generally really lazy. We tend to go for the things, we try to avoid having to think about things too much. And so in this case here, you just simply reach for the thing that's in front of you, and that determines what you end up with. But what we found with a lot of these studies is that even though your behavior is influenced by these unconscious biases, you're generally unaware of this. So when we then ask people, well, how free did you feel about this choice? They think, well, I was completely free. I could have chosen any one of these cards. Um, when we then ask them, well, how many other people do you think would have chosen the same card? They've completely underestimate this. So even though 60% of the people chose exactly the same card, so the predictable card, Card, people tend to estimate that only about 30% of people will actually choose this. So this is a nice illustration of how we can exploit some of these biases to get you to make a certain choice. And of course, this is something that advertisers and supermarkets often exploit. So mm -hmm. next time you go to the supermarket, um, if you want to buy a chocolate bar, Avoid just reaching for the one that is right in front of you because most shops will have put the high price items in the most easily reachable locations because they understand that you're more likely to choose this. So a lot of our behaviors are influenced by these types of cognitive biases. And this is something that is, in, that is um, exploited in lots of domains. Um, now, a lot of these a lot of these biases are exploited in neuroeconomics. Um, so for example, nudging is a technique by which we influence your behavior um, without explicitly telling you what you do, but we just make certain choices more attractive um, and we try and tap into some of these cognitive biases. And indeed, it's kind of like, I mean, the, the David Cameron government, they set up a special nudge unit um, to use these kind of principles to steer people to make certain choices. So a lot of these principles that we are studying within the context of magic are also exploited by politicians and, um, and other forms of marketing and advertising. So do, does this raise the question of, do we genuinely have free will or do we have perceived free will um, without without getting into the uh, religious concepts of it as well but, um... yeah i mean that's a difficult question to answer isn't it i mean philosophers have uh, debated this for more than 2000 years and i don't think they've come up to any conclusion yet um I don't have any answer as to whether we have got free will or not. Um, as psychologists, I'm more interested in your 
subjective experience so do you feel that you've got a free will and this is something that's much easier for us to measure and a lot of the psychological evidence now suggests that there's lots of situations where we feel that we are in control of our actions and yet we're simply not um so for example um so, so in a lot of these forcing studies, so we can force a person's decision and they feel that they've made a completely free choice and yet they, uh, they didn't, actually, they, they didn't uh, have a free choice, we were able to influence them. So that would be a nice demonstration of how you can dissociate your sense of free will from the actual kind of like free will itself. But there's other situations as well. So you can actually have an impact on your actions and yet you don't feel as if you are doing this. So, for example, when you're playing a Ouija board or in pendulums or dowsing. Mm -hmm. So when you, if you use a pendulum um, and you swing this from left to right, if you just visualize the pendulum as moving into a clockwise star in a clockwise direction, that pendulum, pendulum will start to take on that motion. And this is not because of some magical force or so. This is simply because your body is sending out small signals and you are unconsciously influencing the direction of the, of, uh, 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 influencing its movement. Mm -hmm. And so that would be another situation where there's a dissociation between our conscious free will, so us kind of like wanting to do something and the impact that it actually has on the actions. Mm, that's interesting that because there's a lot of people we encounter who are very much into pendulum dousing of one form or another and it always seems to raise the prospect that they may genuinely believe they're doing what they're doing but they are as you say subconsciously influencing it yeah and some of these principles can actually work i mean like with dowsing if you've got an intuition as to where to find water um you will influence that dowsing rod to go in that direction uh, but the influence is not because of the water itself but it's because you are you are unconsciously influencing it so i think that's a very powerful illustration of how you can dissociate your conscious free will from the actual actions as a term i've seen referred to as uh, equivivo, uh, sorry, equivo. Uh, Some wrong people name. call it equivo, others equivoque. Um, I still haven't worked out which one <laughs> yeah. is the right way. Maybe we can just pronounce it either way. Yeah. <laughs> So equivo is a very interesting principle, and this is one that we've been studying quite extensively in the lab. Um, so this refers to a force, uh, which is also known as the magician's choice. So if I have two items in front of you, uh, an apple and a pear, um, I can ask you, well, touch one of these objects. Um, you touch one. If you touch the apple, I say, okay, we're going to use the pear. If you touch the pear, I'm going to end up using the pear as well. So this is an example of what we call an outcome force. So what's happening here is that you've got a free choice, and yet that choice doesn't actually have an impact on the item that you're ending up with. In either case, you'll always end up with the pair. Now, we've studied this extensively in the lab, and we've been really surprised that people are not aware of any of these inconsistencies. So you can do this on several occasions. So we can repeat these kind of procedures, and uh, you make a decision, and you just end up with something else. And we were astonished that people just didn't realize, didn't notice some of these inconsistencies. And we completely flabbergasted by this. So we could perform these types of procedures several times. We repeated this about four times um, in different versions, and people just wouldn't catch on to this. But um, it turns out that the reason why this works is that we are generally quite ignorant to a lot of these inconsistencies. And I can give you a quick example. Um, it doesn't work that well because I've already primed you towards it. But let me ask you a quick question. Now, how many animals of each kind did, did Moses take onto the ark? He didn't take any on. No, he didn't, did he? It was no. Noah. Yes. Now, people get this wrong. Again, in this context, this doesn't work very well in this context because I've already primed you towards this. Yeah. Well, most people get this question wrong and they answer too. Yeah. Even though they're completely, they, they, they know that it was Noah rather than Moses who took uh, yeah. the, yeah, in, in the story. 
So there's lots of situations in our everyday life where we are actually very resilient to some of these inconsistencies. Um, as I'm talking here, I'm sure I'm making lots of grammatical mistakes and stumbles, and I may use the wrong words as well. And if you be aware of each of these inconsistencies and consciously think about it, following my discourse will be incredibly difficult. And so actually ignoring some of these inconsistencies is a really useful heuristic, we call this heuristic or mm -hmm. shortcut that facilitates a lot of human com communication. And I think our brain is finely tuned and sort of like uses this strategy to just paper over some of these inconsistencies. But it does mean that we can use these kind of ink, this blindness towards these inconsistencies to influence your decisions. Um, and again, this is something that we've been implementing into computer games. So we've actually tried this equiv equivocate, see, I can't pronounce it. <laughs> Oh, good. I'm relieved. <laughs> <laughs> I'm constantly stumbling over it. Um, so we've implemented this in the computer game. Uh, and even in this abstract structure, uh, people are not aware of these inconsistencies. So what this really shows is that there's lots of situations where we feel we make a choice, and then we end up with something else and we completely fail to notice that our choice or our decision didn't have an impact on what we get. You're listening to the Weird Tales radio show with Charles Christian. I mean, presumably that's the same thing, you know, you're saying papering over. It's the same thing where if you see a word printed text that the correct letters are there, but they're in the wrong order, the brain can still interpret it. Yeah, we are very resilient to lots of these mistakes. This is why proofreading is so difficult. Proofreading your own work is incredibly difficult because we just skip over a lot of these inconsistencies. So the way to eliminate this is by reading your text backwards. Um, if you do that, um, then you're less likely to paper over these mistakes and you're probably more likely to spot the mistakes. When you say reading it backwards, you mean starting at the end of the sentence and working your way? Yeah, I mean, not the words themselves. Yes. But if you <laughs> <laughs> That'd be very, very difficult, very confusing. But yeah, if you read each word independently out of context, you'll be more likely to actually notice some of these typos. Oh, that's that's intriguing. That's intriguing. That right. And one of the other things that I think most people are familiar with, with if you like stage magic, is misdirection, where the magician has got the patter, is doing other things, and you're actually watching the magician rather than what the magician is actually doing. I mean, Tommy Cooper was always a good one for that with sort of um, clowning around, and so you didn't really notice what he was doing with the trick. Now, is that... You, you see this increasingly being used in politics... Yeah, so we've spent the last 20 years or more studying misdirection, and we've been trying to dissect a lot of the principles that magicians are using. And we came up with a taxonomy of misdirection that tries to explain the different psychological mechanisms that underpin some of these principles. Now, misdirection is not unique to magic. Um, misdirection relies on exploiting lots of blind spots and psychological biases um, that allows the magician to influence what people see and what they miss. And a lot of these principles are also used in politics as well, because they can be used to manipulate the political narrative. So, for example, um, like Boris Johnson's, um, like uh, Boris Johnson famously used this dead cat manoeuvre. Um, so the idea here is if you had a dinner party and throw a dead cat on the table, everybody stops and talks about the dead cat. Now, this is a very effective strategy that politicians often use to deflect attention from some of the real problems. I mean, Trump was a master of this by just uh, releasing another tweet, tweeting something completely outrageous and the whole world's attention was focused on this tweet rather than anything else. So I think a lot of these misdirection principles are applied on a much bigger level by uh, by political strategists and, and politicians to steer and manipulate the general discourse of the, of, of the political dialogue. What's a recent example of Boris and 
throwing a dead cat? Well, I mean, I guess it's sort of like, at what point do you bury bad news? Yeah. Um, so that'd be kind of like a prime example. So if there's a big event happening already, then um, that's a really good time to bring out a report about that reflects unfavorably on your policies. Um, there's also like one of the principles that we've been studying is known as the theory of false solutions. So this is, um, if you actually give someone a solution um, that is false, that can prevent people from working out the true cause of an effect. So Tommy Cooper was a kind of like a master of this, like he, uh, he performed a lot of sucker tricks where he pretended to give away the secret to the trick and then gave, put in a clever twist um, now, we've studied this in the lab as well, um, using very simple magic tricks. So in one of these tricks, it's a bit difficult to just explain without having the visuals, but I'll try my best. But um, so in this magic trick, I would take a deck of playing cards, I would take the eight of diamonds from the cards, put it on the top, and then I would pretend to palm, so secretly can take, remove this card, um, and my hand would move towards my pocket, but just before I reach the pocket, I show everybody actually that was that's not the real solution. Uh, just showing the hand empty, and then then reach into my pocket to reveal the eight of diamonds. And performed like this, I mean, it's a really stupid. It's not a real magic trick because I just had another car, other eight of diamonds inside my pocket. Um, so the solution is very very simple. And if you, if our hand just simply goes back into my pocket without that palming action, most people can work out how it's done. However, implanting this false solution in people's minds prevents them from exploring alternatives. And this in psychology is, now, is known as the Einstellungs effect. And it's been found in lots of other domains as well. So, for example, in chess. So if you're playing chess and you see a solution to the next move, that solution can block and prevent you from searching for more complex alternatives, even if that move is not the ideal solution to the problem. And I think we see this principle often played out in politics, particularly kind of like with populist politics, where people give, where, where politicians provide very simple yet completely implausible and wrong solutions to a problem. And that itself can actually prevent the, prevent people from trying to understand and and, uh, and entertain other more potentially better but more complex solutions to the problem. Mm -hmm. So is that sort of suggesting that we like we like simple solutions? Yeah, we generally like simple solution. The problem, I mean, as of one of the things that emerges through a lot of this research on magic is that a lot of our behaviors are influenced by unconscious processes. So these are con these are processes that you're not consciously aware of, and they can influence your behavior automatically. And the problem is that a lot of this works for even if you try not to be deceived by it. It's a bit like when you go and see a magic performance. Like you, when you're watching a magician, you know that the magician is going to be misdirected your attention and yet you are still being fooled. This is why me telling you about all of these things is not going to change the way that you watch a magic trick because any good magician will still be able to trick you. Yeah. And I'm afraid the same is true in politics. Um, so even if you actually understand some of these principles, they can still be exploited to get you to vote, um, to, to vote in certain ways. Mm, mm. Presumably on, uh, if you like, the criminal side of things that's how con men and scammers work as well isn't it yeah i mean there's always been a very close link i think between scammers and magicians um like a lot of the uh, card slides that we've learned come directly from card cheats yeah. and sure that a lot of the principles that magicians have developed also feed into scammers as well so yeah some of the principles um are often quite similar um, and they generally kind of like rely on exploiting some of these limita cognitive limitations. Mm -hmm. Now, talking about your own magic, what kind of tricks did you do or do you do? What are your favourite, personal favourites? Um, my favourites are, I'd say, sort of more some of the classic effects. I have a slight issue in that I'm a big Theron Brown fan. I love the psychological tricks um, that he uses and sort of this form of mentalism. 
my problem is that I have an ethical dilemma in that even though I love these kind of tricks, I can't perform them without misinforming my audience. And as a scientist, I feel I have a duty to inform people about the science. Um, and so it's very difficult for me to perform these kind of tricks by at the same time misinforming them about the psychological principles. So I'm, at the moment, I'm, I'm really a little bit stuck in <laughs> that. The type of tricks that I would really love to perform, I don't feel I can ethically, um, yeah, I, 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 there's, there's, like, on ethical grounds, I can't really do them. So um, I try to perform, and now what I try to do is I try to perform tricks that do discuss the psychology as well, but not in fraudulent ways. So a lot of magicians, they do use magic tricks and then they claim that they use exploiting certain psychological principles, which they're clearly not. So what I try and do when I do my magic is I perform illusions that are then linked to psychological principles that I can then discuss. So, but it's a very, it's a difficult, it's a really difficult line to follow because on the one hand, of course, magic all relies on deception and lies. Um, and as a scientist, I have to be completely objective. So um, I'm a little stuffed at the moment. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Of the you've mentioned Darren Brown, who else do you see currently as a standout magician? Stan well, there's so many. I mean Darren Brown is great. I love Pentella. Um I just recently watched a video by a guy called Ben Earl, who just completely blew me away with a lot of the psychological subtleties that he uses. Um there's so many fantastic magicians. Um yeah, I can't even start to name them all. What about projects that you're working on coming up in this in this broad field? Because I know you cover other things as well. But, um... So we are covering lots of different projects. A new one that we just started at the moment has been a very interdisciplinary approach to looking at the impact that misdirection has on public health. Mm -hmm. uh, so this is working with anthropologists and people in public health to see whether we can draw links between some of the magic principles that are used to misdirect people and the way that this is used to manipulate and influence people's thoughts about different health issues. Um, we're working in computer science, um, as I mentioned before, trying to understand what happens when computers start deceiving us. Um, we're also trying to implement some of these misdirection and forcing techniques to the better. Uh, to, for, so, for example, we're seeing whether we can use magic principles to create new placebo machines that hopefully be able to um, treat people and maybe make them more, more, more creative mm -hmm. as well. So there's a whole range of principles. So generally what we try to do in the magic lab is we use magic as our basis. We try and study the psychological mechanism that underpins it. And then we try and apply this to the wider domain. Presumably when you're talking about medicine and health, would that be something where dealing with people who reject vaccination for various reasons would, would fit in? Is there... Because, you know, the, the anti-vaxxers are definitely very strong in their opinions and appear to be impervious to logical argument. You know, the Bill Gates is behind it and we're all going to be injected with Microsoft bugs and chips and things. Is that approach where something like what you're studying could help? Yeah, so a lot of the work that we've been doing has been looking at the impact of looking at the impact that magical ex magical experiences can have on people's beliefs, particularly kind of like the way that magic can misinform the public. So I think throughout history, magic tricks have been used to get people to believe in things that are impossible, like from sort of like ancient Egyptian rituals to spiritualists in the, in, the, in the 19th century, as well as sort of like more sort of like the pseudosciences that are being used today. Now, a lot of our work has shown that these types of performances, they can have a significant impact on what people believe to be possible. So in some of these experiments, we, um, we create these these uh like we use magic tricks to create spiritualist experiences so we use deception to get people to believe that it's possible to read people's minds or contact dead people um and what we found rather alarmingly is that even if you tell people that they're watching a magic trick that this can have a significant impact on what people believe to be possible so if you tell someone you're going to see a magician um but the magician 
does a convincing demonstration to demonstrate mind reading, that enhances people's beliefs in mind reading, even if they know that it's fake. Um, so that's got really serious implications for the impact that fake news and misinformation can have on people's beliefs. And so what we're trying to do is trying to see whether we can find ways in which we can mitigate the impact that this misinformation has. Now, you mentioned vaccine. Um, I mean, I just last week I was examining some videos that were sent to me by people who claim that sort of like the evidence for the microchips has been <laughs> these, demos, these, these videos were showing people who take a magnet and put it onto their arm to show that the magnet is now suddenly sticking to their <laughs> arm. And, I mean, it's ludicrous. I mean, it's, yeah, it's quite ridiculous. But the problem is that this kind of information can have a significant impact. And a lot of the research now shows that fictional information can have just as strong an impact on people's beliefs as scientific information. And so I think this is one of the biggest challenges that we as scientists and as society are facing right now. And so we're trying to use magic as a way of seeing whether we can find ways of miti to mitigate the impact that misinformation has. Mm. That's intriguing, that, yes. Well, Gustav, it's been great talking to you and very, very interesting. Thank you very much. Once again, a big thank you to this week's guest, Dr Gustav Kern. To learn more about his research, visit his Magic Research Lab website at www magicresearchlab.com Time for a little bit of folklore which popped up in my email inbox courtesy of local brewery St Peter's located in the Saints area of South Norfolk. We'll have a link to their website on our website and in the podcast metadata. It turns out that June the 15th, which is the day I'm recording this show, is Beer Day Britain, a time to celebrate the drinking of beer, whether traditional ales, lagers or craft beers. Why the 15th of June, you ask? because that is also the day on which the Magna Carta was sealed in the year 1215. Article 35 of that document demands that there be standard weights and measures for wine, beer, grain and cloth. In other words, if I buy a pint of porter in one pub, I should be served exactly the same amount of beer as if I buy a pint of porter in another pub. Beer, it should be noted, was very important in the Middle Ages as it was far safer to drink beer than it was to drink water. Everyone drank it. Children drank it. They drank, down a, drank a slightly watered-down version of it. And um, even nuns in their abbeys and priories drank it. There's a record for one priory up in the Yorkshire Moors which reveals that each nun, each nun drank an average of 56 pints of beer a week. That's eight pints or one gallon every day. And it wasn't just the Brits who had a thing about weights and measures. Back in the late 18th century, when the American colonies had just broken away from the British Empire, the issue of standardising weights and measures was so important that it appeared in Article 1, Section 8 of the US Constitution, as it still does to this day. So just remember that June 15th is Beer Day. Going forward, perhaps it should be made a public holiday, although probably best not to follow those medieval nuns and their drinking habits, especially if you're driving. I have a new book coming out in early July. Yay! It's volume one of a new series called Haunted Landscapes from Heart of Albion Publishing. And the title of the first book is Shuckland, as in Black Shuck, the demon dog of East Anglia. And it looks at weird tales, ghosts, folklore and legends from East Anglia's Waveney Valley area. Here's the blurb. The Waveney Valley is full of history, along with ruined castles, soaring church towers and attractive market towns. There are many legends and much folklore, some ancient, some relatively modern as to give the place an air of intriguing weirdness. 
Old traditions, ghosts of avenging kings, highwaymen, headless queens, ancient buried treasures, demonic entities, notorious villains, treacherous barons, murderous earls, ley lines, paganism, yew shrouded churchyards, old ivy covered houses, witchcraft, strange, fearsome beasts, including Black Shuck, all involving incidents linked to the landscape. The book is in a paperback format with plenty of photos taken by yours sincerely, maps and illustrations, and runs to 199 pages in length. It will be available in bookshops, on Amazon, and directly from here at Weird Tales. Full details on the website in a couple of weeks. We'll also have a Kindle version available later this summer. Now, I know I'm the author, but I'm really excited about this project and work on the second book in the series is already underway. So make a note, Shuckland, part of the Haunted Landscapes series. About 20 miles from where the Weird Tales studios are located is the town of Bury St Edmunds, and in the town museum, called Moises Hall, is a book chronicling the trial and execution of William Corder, who was convicted and subsequently executed for killing his girlfriend Maria Martin in 1827 in an event known as the Red Barn Murder. At this time, the bodies of executed criminals were given to surgeons for dissection and subsequently parts of the deceased would find themselves being offered for sale on the black market as body parts of executed criminals were considered to be a type of lucky talisman. Which brings us back to the book about the trial because the leather cover was made from William Corder's skin. Now, I confess I thought this was a one-off, but apparently back in the 18th and early 19th century, this was a thing. There's even a name for it. Covering books in human skin is known as anthropodermic bibliopagy. And one of the best-known examples of this is the fate of the body snatcher William Burke, he of the notorious duo Burke and Hare. Burke was executed in... Edinburgh in 1829. Now, the duo's business was digging up dead bodies, grave robbing, and selling them to anatomy schools for autopsy work. However, they spotted that it was far simpler to kill living people and sell their bodies for dissection rather than dig up the bodies of dead people. You know, all that shoveling and all that stuff. Anyway, they were executed, Burke was executed for his crimes, and Burke's skin was turned into the cover of a pocket notebook and a wallet which was given to the doorkeeper of an anatomical classroom in Edinburgh. In other words, one of the very dissection rooms where Burke and Hare's stolen corpses had ended up. Which is kind of grimly ironic fate. Now for one of those what-if moments in history where we were so close to a major world-shaking and world-reshaping change, but it just didn't happen. In June 1822, the English inventor, philosopher, mathematician and general-purpose polymath Charles Babbage wrote a paper for the Royal Astronomical Society called Notes on the application of machinery to the computation of astronomical and mathematical tables. This may sound dull as ditch water, but significantly it included a proposal for the creation of a difference engine. In effect, a mechanical computer. And it gets better. Because Babbage went on to design a difference engine, and some work was actually carried out on manufacturing and assembling such a machine. Unfortunately, Babbage kept tweaking the final design. There were disputes over intellectual property rights between Babbage and the company building it, and eventually the money ran out without it ever being completed. Now, and this is where it gets interesting, because in 1991, to celebrate the 200th anniversary of the birth of Babbage, the Science Museum in London constructed a complete difference engine from Babbage's original plans 
and, although it was built only to the machining tolerances available in the mid-19th century, it actually worked. Now, this thing is a beast. It is powered by a series of manually cranked handles, although apparently Babbage also planned a steam-powered version. It weighs several tonnes and stands about ten feet tall. There were no plans for a portable version. However, along with being a steampunk wet dream, all brass cogwheels and goggles, there is a serious side to this, because if Babbage's original difference engine had ever been completed during his lifetime, what we now see as the computing revolution and information age could have started about a hundred years earlier than it actually did, in the mid-19th century rather than the mid-20th. That said, if it had, then all the problems with spam, hackers, online trolls, fake news and data privacy would have also started a century earlier. So, maybe not such a good idea after all. And that's it. Before we go, here's a follow-up on the interview we did with Mark Hartzman about a month ago. One of Mark's books is on the subject of weird things he's found for sale on eBay. And I recently spotted this story in an English newspaper. Apparently a piece of toast, yes, fried bread, from a German soldier's food canteen, that's the tin box he carried his food around with him, saved by a British soldier during World War I. So we're getting on for over 100 years now. Was recently sold at auction for £55 or about 77 US dollars. You can just imagine the soldier's family saying, of all the things you could have brought back as a souvenir from the war, a nice Luger pistol or an iron cross, or even one of those highly decorated Pickelhaub German officer's helmets with the point on the top, and incidentally those sell for around $1,000 on eBay at the moment, and you had to bring home a slice of dry bread. Now it just remains for me to say this is Charles Christian saying thank you so much for listening in. Please join me again next week for more Weird Tales in Weird Times. Until then, stay well, stay weird. Goodbye. Black Shuck, the demon dog of East Anglia, is baying at the moon. Which means it's time for us to go. You've been listening to the Weird Tales radio show with Charles Christian, your weekly fix of ghost stories, urban myths, witchcraft, folklore and the paranormal. You can keep in touch with us online at www.urbanfantasist.com by email to urbanfantasist at icloud.com and on Twitter at urbanfantasist. Join us again next week for another edition of the Weird Tales radio show. Goodbye.